Okay, uh, well, it's, it's great to see you again, Mick. Cheers. Uh, yeah. So I'm talking to Mick Beck, uh, uh, an improvising musician, Sheffield-based improvising musician, uh, in this interview, which, if I can just remind you, Mick, it will form part of my contribution to a Arts and Humanities Research Council Connected Communities Project, which yeah. is called Regency. Yeah. We've had some discussions about <clears throat> the fundamental aims of that project in its broadest sense before, which, to just restate it, is to explore the relationship between strong emotion, but particularly anger, mm -hmm. and creative production. Yeah. If I can just remind you as well, my contribution to that project is a sub-theme which we've called In Angry Tongues, mm -hmm. Uh, because what I wanted to explore is the relationship between anger and creativity among a few people whose, whose work I knew was informed quite directly by a sense of political outrage. I think that that's probably different for us, but I think our interview will certainly enrich and and potentially add a counterpoint to that other discussion. If it is different, it may or may not be. Yeah, yeah. So that's... Uh, that's the territory. That's the territory. Yeah. And we'll <laughs> range as, as freely uh, as, as we wish around that territory and, and for, follow whatever threads we want. Yeah. I thought maybe a good starting point, uh, because I think for many people outside, what is quite, still quite a small audience for free improvised music, it, it might be well worth starting from the practice. Mm -hmm. So you're an improvising musician of, of significant reputation at the risk of embarrassing you, um, and have been involved in free improvisation for 40, 40 years, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah, yeah. So as a free improviser, I know we're going to do some playing in a bit, but what do you do? What's the practice as, as you see it? What's it all about? Well, uh, I think the practice, let me look at it historically, uh, went back to when I started to listen to, to modern jazz in the 1960s. And um, that was an area of a type of music which hadn't appealed to me um, until I became about 15, 16. Um, I mean, I'd always been very taken with music, but... Uh, but not, not particularly jazz. And I, I fell in with a group of folk at school. It was a boarding school, so quite close, um, who, um, who got a lot out of jazz. And I, and I suddenly started to hear things that I could see why they were enthusiastic about it. And, and I think, I mean, harking back to one of your opening statements. Of course, a lot of the emotional background to that was um, black American yeah, protest. Yeah, yeah. So there was, there was a lot of anger and poignancy in the music. And, and in a way, you know, if you, when I think about what, what do I do when I'm actually trying to improvise, in one sense, you could say I'm looking to generate um, the tingle factors right, for okay. other people. In other words, I'm trying to uh, to open up deep emotions for for them. And of course, in doing that, I'm uh, exposing myself to those emotions. Um, and um, uh, the, those tingle factors can be, uh, they can be the full range, um, anger, ecstasy, um, fear, uh, um, love, hope, despair, you know, the, that, that sort of range. Um, and, and I suppose beauty comes into it somewhere. Uh, mm. I mean, there's some other things to say about that as we go along. Mm. Uh, uh, 
but um, now my starting point was jazz. At, th at that time, jazz was going from highly structured to freer, and so the, the kind of uh, aspirational bit was for me to understand what people were doing when they became freer than the, what had been the hard bop sort of era. Right. Uh, and, and there were particular performers who, who really stirred things up uh, by stepping outside the norms uh, of simply playing a chord sequence. And For example? Uh, people, for me, like Eric Dolphy, yeah. uh, Coltrane, yeah. um, in a very different way, Sonny Rollins. Mm -hmm. So, as uh, I fell in love with the saxophone, so those people, those three, were uh, had a profound influence on me in terms of if I take up the saxophone, what sort of noise would I like to make with it? You know, what kind of effects would I like to to look for? And um, and, and I'd say they were the they were the main early influences that I had. Um, but, I mean, there were loads, uh, all, all different instruments too. So, and although I decided to take up the saxophone, I mean, it, I certainly enjoyed the full range of trumpets, trombones, and pianos, and, you know, etc. Yeah, and, et and you're also renowned these days for pulling a, any number of a, an armoury of small instruments from back pockets and stuff, aren't you? And, you, yes. and your improvisations, which I, I guess links into yeah. that in some way. In Different some way, sonic possibilities. It, that, that's really to add colour, right, contrast, okay. if you like, yeah. uh, and, and to generate the, the surprise, uh -huh. um, both for me and for the other musicians. Uh, right, and, okay. and via them, hopefully, communicate with the audience, you know. Right, so there's some interesting, some interesting things that I'd just like to come back to it yeah. already. So when you were describing what your relationship to the, to the music was, it's interesting in the, if, if I start to describe my relationship to what's finished up in the same place as, mm -hmm. as free improvisation, it came later for me, but the, the, the first relationship was to another black music, for me initially, mm -hmm. as, as a 10 or 11 year old, mm -hmm. was towards blues music, particularly the Delta players like Fred McDowell and, yes. and, and people like that. Yeah. Um, and, it's inter and, and that was a, about a music that <coughs> seemed evocative and able to communicate about an experience of uh, what we might call oppression or marginalization or being placed outside that, that I felt bonded to for some reason, even as a, yeah. even as a kind of pre-political young person. I mean, uh, I had quite an influence with a, a, a relationship with the guitar as well, because I, I also uh, got involved in the in the skiffle movement, right? Uh, okay. Uh, when I was younger, when I was about eight to eleven, uh -huh. and then, and then blues. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I really enjoyed trying, you know, playing blues guitar, um, but I was also very much taken with flamenco, uh -huh. which, <coughs> which, again, a highly emotional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, know, you know, music form, but instead of uh, the. The kind of oppression and and suffering, it, it, that, that's much more on a personal level. It's unrequited love, you know, or the <laughs> expression of uh, of of, of uh, passion. That that's the main thing behind flamenco, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I really enjoyed that too, you know. So it was a, it was a, a, a something that I tried to, I suppose, um, bring into my. Um, saxophone playing when I started to do that. Right, now that's, that's, there's, a, there's actually a fascinating synergy across the three interviews plus me that's just occurred. And that is, I was watching the other interviews last night, 
Uh, and although people are working through different forms, like one guy's a poet, another singer-songwriter, you're an improvising musician, uh, I'm a, 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 a politicised researcher who is also interested in creative practice primarily, mm -hmm. uh, improvisation. So although we're from, we've, we've, we're working in different means, and this is, this is interesting because it only becomes visible by placing these interviews together. When Tony, the Pittman poet, is talking about his, his work, he's got a folder uh, on his knee, because he's got his work mm. in it because he's reading some stuff. Mm. And on the folder cover, it says, Love and Loss. Mm -hmm. He never actually announces his aesthetic project, if you like, right. as one of love and loss. Yeah. But it sat there on, on the picture. Yeah. Then I watched the second interview with Mal. Mm. Uh, and at one point, I think she's talking about songs that she wrote just before Greenham and she was imprisoned at mm -hmm. Holloway. Mm -hmm. And she says something like, off the top of my head, it's a very similar statement to this. She says, it's, it's love and loss, Jeff. It's love yes. and loss. Yeah. Uh, I spent some time bringing together a, a, a number of poems that are themed, that are not published, because I've never tried to publish them, mm. but are themed around love and loss. Mm. So, in a sense, although we're all brought together in a project that's looking at the relationship between anger and creative production, uh, the synergy that's emerging is that there's something about love and loss mm that is maybe also present as a resonance in forms of creative production that are often about marginalization or uh, uh, isolation as, as the uh, Spanish gypsy mm. case of flamenco and so on. So it just struck me when you were, mm. you'd already said that there's a, there's a strong emotional context to your work Mm. You, you've outlined five or six different forms of affect, mm. five or six different forms of emotionality, and then you added almost as an afterthought beauty, mm. uh, and then have, have introduced a, two minutes after that the notion of a, an unrequited something or other mm. that I guess is, is like a kind of expression about love and loss. I'm struck by that. Mm. Does that is, you can't anything to say, say about that? No, I think it, it's probably something that, that I would expect to find in uh, in a lot of musicians because or, or poets um, because music, poetry, and and indeed the visual arts, uh, they're all about expressing passion. And, um, and and there, there's a sort of connection. I think when I talked about, when I mentioned beauty, uh, you know, we're talking grand words here. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm thinking there's a link, there's a link for me between um, beauty and, and, and what I'll call truth. Now, I mean, I, mostly I don't believe in Truth is a single entity, if you, if you know mm, what I mean. Mm. But, uh, but there's something about telling it the way it is, you know, uh, about being honest, being open, uh, about expressing these different emotions, um, and 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 beauty and truth are very close for me. I think, uh, and and I was thinking about this. Um, a couple of days ago, when and I'd, I'd been listening to um, some folk music, uh, which was which was touching on deep emotions, mm. but the way it did it was by reporting quite ordinary domestic situations, uh, and and then uh, exploring the intense feelings that lie behind some of them, you know. I mean, which could be something as, 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 uh, as interesting as um, the, the, way you, the way you handle your toothpaste tube, you know, or something like that, because, as we know, those minutiae 
it really can have a profound effect on relationships which which at, at one level ought to be about something a bit more um, substantial than that, but little things can get in the way. Um. <coughs> so, so is that about the capacity of the everyday to to uh, open up universality then? Is, is that... What, what I perceive, it, but with um, certain types of music, it's deliberately treating uh, uh, everyday treating with everyday occurrences mm. and saying uh, or pointing out that there's intense emotions involved, involved in them. With the, the sort of music that I play, um, which hasn't got words, or not many, yeah. uh, that the whole thing is more abstract. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think conceptually, um, it explores what I'll call beauty or truth mm -hmm. through, um, I mean, this might sound a bit pretentious, but, but, but through some quite philosophical uh, ways of looking at things, like how do you elucidate truth through things like paradox or confusion and um, and I, th I, th I think in, in free music in particular, there's quite a lot of both of those things which are thrown into the mix and, and which I enjoy working with. So I don't know whether that sort of helps or confuses. No, no, it, no, it, it, no it's, a really, it's a really rich point because... Yeah, just just let me gather a few thoughts that of the that last couple of minutes of discussion has prompted. So, if 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 we if we establish or if we use a vocabulary like passion, uh, authenticity, mm -hmm. and s truth and such like. Mm -hmm. It, we could quite, and I'm not suggesting that this is the case, mm. it's, I'm just kind of partly being a bit of a devil's advocate, I suppose, intellectually. You could argue, and, and those comments that you've just used would be echoed for, for Mal mm -hmm. and for Tony. I think that, you know, when you have a look at the videos, uh, you, you'll hopefully see what I'm referring to. So there's nothing... There's nothing uh, dissimilar mm -hmm. in what you're saying from what they're saying. Mm -hmm. They say similar types of things. Okay, yeah, good. Um, yeah. But you could argue mainly that, that that's largely a romanticist perspective in terms of classic, classical romanticism of art as, as the, the expression of, of emotion as a route to... Authenticity. Mm. I think your secondary comments seem to be kind of adding a rider to that. If I'm hearing, or this is what I'm hearing, that it's almost as if you're saying, "Yeah, I think these issues like truth uh, and authenticity and expression are still significantly at the heart of whatever it is that we do." We do. Yeah, yeah, but. Don't assume thereby that there's any straightforward representational relationship mm. between the the art product mm. and that process. Is that kind that's, of what you get? That's getting correct. At? Yeah, I'm right. saying I'm saying the music in in uh, wordless music is by its nature is a bit more abstract, and and in particular, I think the. Uh, the free music side of music is is even more abstract, mm. if you like. Mm. Mm. Yeah, carry on, mate. Uh, and no, that was the end of that statement. Um, I think. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's I think that's rich because so the. the it seemed that what you were saying is that therefore the capacity for ambiguity uh, and and 
finer interrogation of that experience, if you like, mm. is greater given the abstraction and non-representative, yeah, non-representational yeah, nature yeah. of, that's right. of and things like what ambigu- you're up to. Ambiguity uh, and, and the, and the word I yeah, yeah, surprise, paradox, confusion, you know, those, those things are um, c- quite, they're quite accessible, I think, f- f- for, um, f- for the free improviser. Yeah, um, yeah. Because you can either be making a, a really beautiful sound uh, or you can be messing about with a toy or, uh, or doing something as ugly as possible, you know. So it, it, it's, um, it, it's got a lot of scope. For, uh, for introducing contrast and surprise, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, but I guess there are there are improvisers and and not schools of improvisation, but but certainly clusters of thought amongst some improvisers, maybe coming out of cage and that kind of mm. uh, background, who would who would try and take as much of that apparent romanticism out of the experience by deploying chance and, mm. and so on and so forth. So it's not, it's not universal among, among improvisers that they would start from that emotional content that you started from, no. is it? No. Although some clearly would. So mm. the, there's a highly politicised approach to improvisation as... As raw expression, I guess. Mm. Uh, I suppose I'm thinking Brutzman and mm. early albums like Machine Gun, you know, which is mm. almost speaks for itself in in the in the title. Yes. Um, did you feel, as you got around improvisation as a community, did it feel like a community that fell into? Schools, some of which were political, I suppose cardio is a classical example, and others that weren't. Did you find a tension in that or, or not? Or was it, wasn't that? Um, it wasn't something that I really specialised in. I mean, I, I was aware that, that some of, I mean, I suppose when I, when I became involved in the free scene to a serious extent, that was um, in, in London. In the late 1970s, right, and um, and there were quite a number of people um, uh, in the f- the forefront who were adopting a, a very political stance. I'm thinking about you know, Pete, Steve Beresford, for instance, yeah. and, and some of the other people involved in the London Musicians Collective, and uh, and, uh, and to be honest, that that didn't really interest me too much. Um, I, I was more focused on how can I get to the raw emotions and bring them alive. Right, right, right. And you, you didn't take experience any tension in that then? Uh, uh, Not particularly, no. Right, no. right, right. Well, okay. I chose to ignore it, right. if you like. Um, so, I, so my attitude was um, if, if people want me to do certain things from a political point of view, then um, um, I'm not going to be manipulated in that way. So I'll, I'll do what feels genuine to me. And, and if people like it, then that's well and good. And if they don't, then too bad. Right. So this, this has been about, uh, about the, the integrity... Uh, uh, of your autonomy in a sense yeah. and, and, and being able to pursue yes. an autonomous uh, vision of, of what it is that, that, that you're doing in musical terms. That's right, yeah. But if, if I, I mean, one thing that struck me, because I've come to know you since you came up to Sheffield, is also a generosity a social generosity, if you like, related to the music, about bringing outfits together, some 
significant and serious projects like feed packets, mm -hmm. more recently in which I was fortunate enough to be involved, gated community, yeah, yeah. which seemed to, I guess you could look at those and say, yeah, you know, they are classic cases of the kind of collective generosity that was espoused as part of that, that free movement from its kind of political point of view? Or is that just that you, you're generous by nature, which I know um, you are generous by nature? Or has that been informed by, no, this is part of the spirit of this music? I think part, part of um, my, my interest in, in drawing almost like uh, groups at random together, which is how both of those bands started, um, was always in, um, I know what a contribution the music has made to, to my psyche, my psychological development. Right. And uh, I'd like to open it up for other people if they're, if they're willing to be engaged in it. So it was, it was more, a, a, more a question of, of sharing an experience rather than a political stance, I think. Right, okay, okay. That's, maybe, maybe this is a point where I should be more explicit about what I mean by political. Okay, yeah. uh, And I should have perhaps maybe done that earlier on, but never mind, we'll do now. Um, so perhaps if somebody had talked to me 25 years since mm -hmm. about what I meant by political, it would have been not necessarily party political, but it would have been much closer to what we might mean by activism. Mm -hmm. it, would have, it would have been an activist-type practice. Mm -hmm. I think what I mean by political now is, is a form of being that, that, that problematizes, challenges, and identifies the non-obvious circuits of power. So it's, it's power-focused, but that might mm -hmm. be very much micro-power mm -hmm. rather than the macro-power. Mm. So in that sense, I think even, for, for me, improvisations, challenges to orthodox mm, and commonplace musical aesthetics is political in the sense that I mean it is. It's, yes. it's kind of challenging the, uh, the, the power structure of the grades and all the rest yeah. of it and, and a that, proper sound and yeah, all of that. So, that, that. so it's more micro-political. Yeah, the okay. The, uh, that there's got in some re head. resonances for me in what you say there. I mean, uh, certainly one of the reasons why when I came back into music, because I'd sort of given it up for five years, really, in my 20s, um, and I came back and found that I was much more taken with the free side rather than the jazz side of, of music and, and, and that was because of the, um, the, the power games, if you like, right. and, uh, or the way the music was set up, that with jazz it was, you know, you state a theme and everybody does a solo and yeah, yeah. then you restate the theme. And, and there's a definite leader to the group. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I guess, quite hooked on the notion of democracy right, okay. in, in, the, in the free music context and wishing to, uh, wishing to avoid explicit leaderships if, where possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and that, that obviously hooks into power power struggles and or um, the, the way um, well the I way guess a sensitivity towards the way that power, power, an power moves and, yes. and circulates yes. isn't it yeah. uh, and who's regarded as the authority and, and, yeah, you're, yeah. and you're certainly right about uh, for me it was important not to go into something that looked like exams and grades and things like that so, when formal institutions attempt, as they do more now, to, to 
to teach something like improvisation, that rings quite a number of warning bells for me. Right. You know, I, I tend to think, oh, I'd like to keep away from that. Right, OK. <laughs> so if we can just pause on that for a minute then. and, and so, so there is, and I mean, it's not even, I'd said that uh, the sense of political that I'm using it is, is quite a distant from party political. Mm. But you've actually introduced the term democracy mm. that's explicitly political, may not be party political mm. in terms of improvised music, but mm. it's an explicit political domain. Mm. Um, so, and, and that's, maybe that's what I could sense in my experience of your projects like Feed Packets mm. and Gated Community. Yes. I'd... So that does sound like the, the, as part of your creative project, there is a political aspect to yeah, it. I'd, I'd... In in terms of that democracy, then what what is it that makes it up for you? Is is it is it an anti an anti institutionalism, which is what you just said about mm. jazz education? Mm -hmm. Is it about the inclusion of marginalised voices? Is that what democracy mm. might do? Mm. Or is it, a, is it a kind of anti-authoritarianism uh, that might be around for a bunch of interviewees come to coming back to this project? Me, you, you're a wee bit older than me. Mal's a couple of years older than me. Tony's a couple of years younger. But we are of an age, mm. and of an age where questions of authority and power, i.e. the 60s, from beginning to the end of that decade, mm. when those topics were, were very much on the agenda. Mm. So I guess, I guess one internal question within this project that raises its head is, maybe all this shows, is that those that grow up in the 60s who become involved in creative production are creatures of the 60s. They mm. tend to be exercised by mm. questions of power, responsibility, control, democracy, yeah. and so on. What do you think? I think that, um, for me, there's elements of all of those things in, in my use of the word democracy in that context, but I think the most important things for me um, are and, and were uh, it's the inclusivity right. bit. Right. So it's it's giving people a voice, right. and, uh, and and uh, and and in terms of the practice of helping people to to listen so they can hear those voices and respond to them. So it's uh, I think those, those are things that I hold dear. Right, okay, okay. And I, I think I'm going to move into that and link that into your particular biography. I also just want to highlight something that I want to make sure that we come back to because you said a few minutes since that the experience of being involved in, in improvised music had, had uh, thrown light upon aspects of your own reflection on, on your own mm. kind of psychological uh, yeah. experience and makeup and, yeah. and sense of being in the world that sounded close to maybe the, the involvement in a form like this as some kind of, for want of a better phrase, therapeutic yeah. aspect. And I want to park that and come back to that because I'm interested okay. in yeah. that. Yeah. But if we can, we can shift then to your biography. So you hold dear a st the, the creation of a space in which voices can be in which included. Voices can be included and heard by, uh, by a larger number of people than used to hear them, if you like. Right. That, I think, again, that's probably common across the three interviewees and, mm. and me as a participant in this mm -hmm. project, articulated in slightly different ways, but I think yeah. it's common. In terms of your own experience of blindness, does that relate in any straightforward way to that 
sense of attention to spaces of inclusion. It may or may not. I guess the reason I'm asking that is that for Mal, I think the experience of uh, coming out as a lesbian, uh, for Tony, the experience of living in a South Yorkshire community which he feels he's been unable to leave mm -hmm. but has never really belonged to, right. uh, have, have been experiences that... That, that, that sense of difference mm. has been an experience that's led to a focus on the need to in include voices of difference, if that's mm. not too turgid a way of expressing it. Do you get where I'm heading? Yes, uh, I think so. Okay. Um, I mean, the link to blindness... Um, I'd say there's there's a couple of things that I'll say. I mean, one one is um, that in terms of an underlying emotion, uh, I have been aware that that I have repressed anger about blindness, about being blind, which uh, needs to as it were, have the, the, the lid taken off it every now and again. And, uh, and, and doing music of any sort is a good way of doing that, mm. you know, so it's quite convenient. Um, uh, it's also, music is uh, a very obviously accessible mm. um, medium for uh, blind folk to get involved in uh, for the obvious reasons that it's, it's treating with sound rather than pictures or uh, words in print which might not be accessible you know so so there are some practical as well as uh, emotional connections uh, as to why you know music was where uh, where I sought personal expression if you like mm -hmm. um, um, I'm not it wasn't the only form uh, of personal expression, but <clears throat> um, having having said that, um, again, there's a thing about being in a school for blind people, which does separate you from the rest of society, uh, and. The, the natural there's a there's a reaction against that so so when I left school and went to uh, ordinary university I suppose uh, I was very keen to integrate mm -hmm. with what the rest of the world was doing um, whereas in the in the school there was a bit of a tendency to uh, to hold the school apart and say, right. you know, you're you're separate, mm -hmm. uh, and your blindness is partly to do with that. Um, so, um, I'm probably veering off your question. I think no, it's no, it's not. It's um, productive, but it, it's so it's it's a background factor, you know, uh, the blindness to the selection of the medium, and to some of the concerns, yeah, of want, wanting, being, being aware that often um, people need help to, to start getting their voices heard, or even to be able to identify what it is that they're trying to say, and, and that's obviously a link through to the, the therapy side of, of my life. Um, so, so, so there are some connections, um, and those are the um, those are the, the the main read across elements, I'd say. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it's a f few things in in the the uh, I'd like to stay with if if I can, and, mm. uh, but I'm also I'm just going to throw in something that I'm 
prompted uh, to say more intuitively than anything else, or maybe because it's it's interested me for such a long time. I remember getting postcards from you in Spain uh, way back, way mm. back when primarily uh, I think it may have been a postcard to Jill when she used to work mm -hmm. uh, in the same uh, civil service area as you, mm -hmm. where where the sense of visual experience uh, was extraordinary. They were like letters from a painter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that's just... I, mean, I don't know where that takes us, but I well, have to kind of position uh, it. Yes. I uh, need to put it into this somehow. Observation. And my, there were letters of a painter. They were extraordinary. Yeah. See, but my, my observation about that is that it, it, I do think visually. Mm. So my brain still thinks it can see, you know, or, or I can see in the way that it reacts. So that, I mean, that under, underlies the, the, is, is why I write, if you like, as though I can, as though I can see, since it comes naturally to, uh, to my particular brain, you know. And I think some people do, it's a known phenomenon, um, that some people think very visually stroke physically and others are more abstract and I think I'm, I'm quite physical really. Yeah. Well I mean that certainly struck me um, uh, and I suppose as I've thought about it more recently I've wondered purely in an open way what it might be like to feel so drawn to a language, i.e. visual language, but, but to be unable to, to uh, fill that language out, as, as mm -hmm. it were, what, how, how that might just feel for, for oneself to be, yes. to be removed from a source of something that feels like a, a place of familiarity. And I, I, yeah, I think probably that, if you like, that that um, identifies one of the sources of repressed anger. Because that, it, it's right, a that's, sort of, that's where I was heading. It's, it's a frustration, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that, that says it all, really. So, so that, I mean, that wasn't the link that I no. was trying to lead you down. I, I was just curious, I just thought... A sort of clarification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I guess for me, the longing to express myself within sound is, is a profound and deep longing that, is, is, that almost has the um, uh, depth and loneliness of an unrequited mm -hmm. love, right. because I don't ever know whether in one lifetime mm -hmm. I've got time to get the the wherewithal in terms of technical facility and all number of things. Mm -hmm. I don't think it boils down to technical facility, but I don't think you can do it without mm -hmm. technical facility. I don't know whether in one lifetime I've, I can ever... That, whether that relationship can ever be fully requited. Mm. And that's difficult enough for me, knowing what the language is. Mm. But to even, to imagine a, a greater depth of, of removal from the, the subject of the unrequited love is, is like really, really difficult. Mm. Uh, yes, yes, well... I mean, um, I think you've, I think you've summed it up uh, very well. You know that as a, um, as a description of why there, why there are feelings of frustration and and or uh, in in your case of a, a, a fear of not being able to get as far as you want to, yeah. um, but which is very similar territory to be in, isn't it? So in terms of, 
Yeah, so, so, so for me, it stays as, I guess, to put a fine distinction between frustration and anger. Mm. It stays within frustration mm. because the only way that it could be rage is that lives are not long enough to get mm. around a music like this, it mm. seems to me. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think I need two or three at least. Yes. You might only need one, but I think I need two or three. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, so, but, but that's frustration. It's not that I find myself in a particular position that I can't hear anymore, so it's not possible mm. anymore. Mm. And that seems to me, forgive me if I'm wrong, but that seems to me to be a sort of order of difference that if I were in a position where the language for which I long and feel inclined is not available to me, that might tip it into anger. Mm -hmm. rather beyond frustration. Does that make any sense at all, the, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, there? I think so. I mean, what... Uh, I think, for, for me, I, mean, I tend to think of frust frustration is repressed anger. Right, OK, OK, right. No, that, that's helpful. I, I understand that. I understand that. Rather than a different... Yeah, yeah. yeah, got, yeah OK. So... So what has that relationship been like for you then, Mick? A relation to a knowledge, a reflexive knowledge of a repressed anger, you know, where has that led you into, both into self-practices as, as well as aesthetic practices to do with your music and stuff, um, if that's not an intrusion? No, it's fine. I, I mean... Um I think a philosophical or, or a belief, a belief is that um, that repressed things need need to be expressed every now and right. again. You know, not necessarily all the time. That can be could be a bit tedious, but <laughs> but but you do need to take the cork out of the bottle every now and again, uh, uh, and. So, so it is like a safety valve, um, and and certainly music is that for me. It is a personal safety valve, and and of course it it feeds directly across to my beliefs in terms of therapy. Um, in in that, uh, it's it's usually something that again you need to work on with with uh, individuals uh, in order to help them to to articulate what it is that that they feel frustrated or angry about and, and, and so on <coughs> and that helps them to you, you know it takes the cork out of their bottle so it's a, it, at one level you could say it's a damage limitation thing but I mean I think it, it when it comes to, uh, if I bring it back into the the practice of music, uh, you can you can generate some some effects, some sounds, uh, which are very expressive, mm. uh, and which communicate not only to yourself but to others, and that's that's one of the aims. Uh, of, of learning to play music and 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 for me, I, I probably I am uh, in the school that that says I need to do quite a bit of personal practice <laughs> in order to um, remain articulate um, in in what I want to the instrument to say, you know, if I put it that way. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the other participants would echo right. what's, what's being said. Yeah. Uh, and I would echo that I think creative practice has, has made my life, when it's been difficult, somewhat easier. Right. Uh, at, at the very least. Yeah. Um, so that's echoed right across. Okay. What I, what I definitely wanted to capture for this interview 
is because another thing that strikes me that strikes me about your playing uh, across the years probably to a greater extent than than anybody else who I've been around is the role that the humor plays in it mm-hmm. and the role that a particularly outrageous humor plays in it and a, a particularly um, um, uh, how can I, I'm, I'm not sure I can get the term for it. It's almost childlike, and I don't mean to say yeah. it's childish. Mm-hmm. It's it's outrageous in a childlike way. You, let's say that it's not rare for you to explore the digestive aspects of the bassoon, for example. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I mean, I, th- I think that's absolutely wonderful, and I think it's a wonderful part of, the, of what you do as a creative artist. And I, I know the, the, the other people who are working with humour, me to a lesser extent, I think I'm just personally so morose uh, <laughs> that I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm out of touch with the humour a bit. And so maybe that's a, a learning point from this project. But, but Mal, uh, we have Mal on film doing, uh, an, again, an outrageous piece of music that, that, that flips the experience of being a lesbian into the dominant sexuality and, and being straight as, as the minority sexuality. And it's so, so funny a song. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, humor's uh, very important to her. Mm-hmm. And Tony's work, as much as it's, it's angry, is humorous as well. Mm-hmm. So I do, I do, I'd, I'd just like to explore that. So well, it all sounds a bit dour in a sense that we've kind of got this, we, we, you know, we need catharsis and so on. Yeah. But you work a great deal with humour. What's happening there for you? Uh, I think um, put, uh, you know, there's a, one fairly simple response to that is, is that um, use of humour uh, is a means of exercising some control. So it does, uh, it, it feeds into the ability to communicate. And, um, uh, and, and when I use humour in m- music, it's, it, I suppose, that, that must be an underlying factor. I'm, I'm not using that usually consciously at the time but um, uh, I just want people to have a laugh you know uh, yeah. and um, um, th- and that's 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 the long and the short of it I think uh, I noticed from an early age I think that when music made me laugh that was an experience of happiness and uh, so I guess I've just picked that up. So it might be a bit simple-minded, but I mean, it, it's it's like when I'm working with with people who who use humour a lot as a, as a, in the therapeutic context. What what I would look at with them is how much are they um, uh, using it to shield. Their, their actual feelings um, uh, and to control themselves in, in not to have those underlying feelings. But I don't think in a musical context that that, um, that dilemma or dichotomy uh, does operate for me. I think the, the humour in the music is just try and get people to have a good time, you know. <laughs> right, right, okay. I think probably across the the, uh, the interviews, there's a sense that, I think everybody would say there is a cathartic aspect and there's a, there's a, there's a therapeutic aspect as well, i.e. that people articulate themselves as yeah. having been better placed in the world. Mm. Because of their creative, their their capacity for creative expression, mm-hmm. that it's enabled them yes. as individuals, yeah. both Mal, Tony, me. Yeah. So I think everybody recognises that. I think everybody also has recognised that 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 to stay in rage, mm. particularly, 
is is one counterproductive. It kind mm. of burns you out. Right. And two, it's aesthetically flat. It's like the same kind of level, mm. full on, full blast, mm. and it, it eventually is is very flat. It loses its effect. So yeah, yeah. so it, yeah. it loses its effect, and yeah. I, I think that's partly partly what you're saying. So I think everybody therefore is recognizing, in terms of the overall aims of the project, as we imagine a space where rage is transformed. That there is a necessary transformation of it, mm. or cooking of it, or whatever you might like to put it, yeah. that is necessary prior to or as part of creative production. That we can't work, or mm -hmm. at least the people that we've talked to on this small project can't work purely out of rage, out of rage. when they've yeah. been yeah. in the place of rage. They have been subject to it and have not been autonomous. And it's hence that the autonomy, the agency mm. in regency, occurs as anger becomes transformed. I think that's the theme that's emerging. Right, I yes. don't know whether you've got a, yeah. a kind of final comment on whether that seems to make any sense to you. Uh, I think it does. Yeah. It does make sense. Yeah. Um, there is a. So, you know, in a way, you, know, you can bring it back to um, something as. Um, uh, as simple as um, you know, variety is the spice of life, and y you can't go on just just being angry or upset. Uh, you need you need other things to change the colours, which is an another reason why I pull silly whistles out of it. <laughs> you know, you know. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, that's the only uh, addition that I mate to what you said okay thanks mate so may, maybe i mean that's 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 great that's a great discussion and and it has rich resonances across the project so thanks mm. very much uh, mm. and maybe now it's time to possibly yeah. pull some whistles out of your pocket yeah. or at least get hold of that of saxophone that's sat across the room there yeah okay. yeah yeah okay